Good morning to everyone here in New York City and good evening konbanwa to all of you in Japan and good afternoon to all of you from around the world. We're delighted to welcome you to our event this morning in partnership with Asia Society titled Japan versus COVID-19, a conversation with His Excellency Takono Taro, Minister of Defense of Japan. My name is Sakako Hikotani, Associate Professor of Political Science and a member of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University. It is our great honor to welcome Minister Kono back to Colombia following his first visit as Foreign Minister in September 2017. Although Minister Kono is someone who requires no introduction, please let me briefly explain to you what, he makes, what makes him an exceptional leader in Japan. First, he's truly international. A graduate of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, he was an exchange student to Poland during his undergraduate years and has interned in Congress and the Senate. And in the two years as foreign minister between August 2017 and 2019, he traveled to 77 different countries and spent 290 days abroad, or one out of three days as foreign minister, far more than any previous foreign ministers of Japan. He also visited 14 countries that no other Japanese foreign minister has visited, including Ecuador, South Sudan, Bhutan, and Iceland. He established close ties with other foreign ministers, including meeting 23 times with Korean Foreign Minister Kong, 14 times with Secretary Pompeo, and 11 times each with foreign ministers of Russia and China. He has continued his active engagement with his counterparts as defense minister, engaging in phone meetings this past couple of weeks. Second, while his very useful useful looks may be somewhat deceiving, he's actually a veteran politician with wide-ranging expertise. An eight-term member of the House of Representatives since 1996, the positions he has held are Minister in Charge of the National Police Organization, Minister for Administrative Civil Service Reform and Regulatory Reform, and Minister in Charge of Disaster Management. He was also Chairman of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives. Finally, Minister Kono is known for being very outspoken and accountable to the public and approachable. He has been active on social media far longer than any other politicians with 1.6 million followers on his Japanese Twitter account. Some of his followers may be joining us today. Since he became defense minister in 2019, he has been actively sharing his daily activities, making the public more familiar with what the defense minister does and with the activities of the self-defense forces overall, including self-defense's role and activities dealing with the COVID-19. All this makes it extremely fortunate for us to welcome him today. I look forward to hearing his assessment of the lessons learned from Japan's experience with coronavirus and his insight into what Japan can play in the, at what role Japan can play in the global response, as well as the broader security implications of the pandemic in the region. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is an event in partnership with the Asia Society and Asia Society Policy Institute. And with great pleasure, I would like to introduce Mr. Daniel Russell. Mr. Thanks, Russell, Takako. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to introduce you. Uh, Mr. Russell is a Vice President for International Security and Diplomacy at the Asia Society Policy Institute, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service at the U.S. Department of State. He most recently served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs and has served at the White House as Special Assistant to the President and National Security Council Senior Director for Asian Affairs. So um, um, please, Danny. Thank you very much, Takako. Um, the Asia Society has been conducting a series on COVID Asia and the world. So now it's really great to be able to partner on a webcast with the Weatherhead Institute. And Minister Kono, um, your entire uh, background is so impressive. What I'm impressed by is that a Georgetown grad agreed to give a talk to Columbia University students. So um, good on you for doing that. But in all seriousness, you have been not only a wonderful friend of the Asia Society, but a true friend of the United States. And we think, thank you for that. Uh, I find it amazing that when you were studying in Washington, you managed to not just work for two different senators, but work for a Republican and Democratic senator at probably the opposite ends of the political spectrum. So I think you know uh, a lot and have a special understanding of uh, the United States. Really appreciate your willingness uh, to join you. And lastly, I just have to say that I think that uh, your mask with that uh, Hiroshige uh, woodblock print, the Ukiyo-e is 
going to start a big fashion trend in the United States and probably all over the world. Uh, but back to you, Takako. Thank you, Danny. Um, let me just um, say how we will proceed today. First, we will ask Minister Kono to speak. Then Mr. Russell and Ms., uh, Ms. Minister Kono will engage in some conversation and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, please, viewers are very much encouraged to send questions throughout the event. Please do not hesitate. Um, through the comment box on Facebook and YouTube and through the Twitter, through Twitter using the hashtag Asia Society Life or COVID World WEAI, uh, WEAI or through email to moderator at asiasociety.org. So please, um, uh, Minister Kono, please begin your presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening and uh, good morning to those in the United States. Thank you very much, uh, hikotani san for inviting me over to this occasion to talk about what our Self-Defense Force has been doing uh, against uh, COVID-19. So, um, well, although hikotani san told me not to use too many slides, uh, I, I cut them down to the minimum number. So uh, without much ado, let me uh, start my presentation. So please proceed with my slides, whoever that is. Good. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, I want to talk about uh, our self-defense force and uh, what they have been doing for uh, COVID-19. Uh, there are three things, Operation Diamond Princess, uh, Self-Defense Force uh, went into uh, the now famous the cruise ship Diamond Princess. And then Self-Defense Force Central Hospital who took care of the foreign patients from uh, Diamond Princess. And uh, education and training, uh, SDF members are doing uh, some training to the general public. Uh, so uh, next slide please. Well, the cruise ship uh, Diamond Princess uh, is uh, now very famous. It flies British flag. It was operated by, it is operated by American company. It has Italian captain and uh, it has passengers from 36 countries and uh, crew from 46 countries. And in total, uh, 3,711 people on board when the Diamond Princess came to Yokohama. And uh, although, well, according to the international law, probably uh, the British government uh, would have been responsible for taking care of all the issue on this ship, but it was in the port of Yokohama, uh, UK was far away. So I guess the Japanese government had to uh, take up this uh, issue and the self-defense force was called in to uh, tackle this uh, problem. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Diamond Princess came to Hong Kong on January 25th, and the passenger who got off there was found uh, uh, infected with COVID-19. And then the first COVID-19 patient was found on February 1st on board, and the ship came to Yokohama on February 3rd and the Japanese government decided to start testing uh, all the passengers and the crew members against uh, COVID-19. It started on February 4th and the self-defense force was called in on February 7th and then February 14th those who tested negative and spent certain days on ship started to get off the ship and by February 22nd, all the passengers, either well, those who had a symptom of COVID-19 were sent to the hospital in Japan. And those who tested positive with uh, no symptom were sent to a uh, dorm in Japan. And those who were tested negative started to go home. And the March, by March 3rd, all the crew members uh, get off the ship. Um, next slide, please. So out of 3,700 uh, people on board, uh, finally seven, 712 people got infected with COVID-19. 
and 672 had uh, either fever, pneumonia, cough, or whatever symptom. And just about 40 people were asymptomatic. And unfortunately, 13 people died in the hospital. And the Self-Defense for Central Hospital uh, admitted 107 uh, passengers and crew, and they all treated well and they all recovered. And those foreign uh, passengers, crew uh, member already gone home. Um, next slide, please. So what Self-Defense Force did on the Diamond Princess is uh, uh, they start taking sample from the body for uh, PCR testing. And many passengers on board were uh, very old. I mean, they were enjoying their retirement on the cruise ship. So there are some people in 80s, 70s, 60s, and quite a few of them had a diabetes or heart disease already, and they needed the medication. And they weren't expecting to stay on ship so many days. So what we had to do is uh, we bring in all the medication and uh, distribute the medication to the right passengers and the crew. Uh, Self-defense force member also had to take those uh, people who had the symptom, who developed the symptom of COVID-19 uh, we, we need to drive them to the hospitals. And also uh, those who tested negative, we had to send them to airport so they could go home. And after they left the ship, we need to uh, disinfection the ship. And the Self-Defense Force Central Hospital, as I said, got 107 patients uh, that they treated well. Well, actually, nearly 5,000 Self-Defense Force members were involved in this Diamond Princess uh, incident. Uh, some 2,700 in total went on board Diamond Princess and 2,200 took care of those patients or asymptomatic uh, passengers crew uh, on land. And none of those 5,000 uh, Self-Defense Force members got uh, infected. Um, next slide, please. Well, uh, here I'm showing some photos what they've been doing on the ship. Uh, collecting sample for testing, uh, sorting out the medication for passengers, and uh, some people wear, wearing Tyvek suit, uh, which is a personal protection equipment. Uh, you can tell some people are just wearing mask and glove. Some people wearing a uh, Tyvek suit. Uh, those who are wearing uh, just a mask and uh, uh, gloves, they were in so-called uh, green. Well, not, they were not so green, but the green zone. And those who are in the red zone, uh, who have some risks of getting coronavirus, they had to wear uh, Google, uh, Tyvek suits and all those things. And the reason, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. The reason why those five, nearly 5,000 Self-Defense Force member, none of them got infected, uh, we put out uh, very strict uh, healthcare rules. So you have to wear certain uh, gear in red zone, you have to wear mask and glove in green zone, and when you go between red zone and green zone, you have to follow the each steps, how you have, how you wash your hands, how to put up mask and shields and all those things. And we simply told self-defense force members to just obey all the rules every day, and uh, they meticulously uh, obey these rules, and that's why uh, none of them get infected. We actually made a video uh, for education purpose. Uh, we show that to the Self-Defense Force members and now we are using this video for education uh, now. Um, so I would like to show one video out of that. Uh, it is to how to move from, sorry, I said green zone to red zone, but it's wrong how to move red zone into green zone, the risk zone to safer zone. Uh, the, key to, the key is how to take 
of the personal uh, protection uh, equipment. When you put them on, it's okay, but when you take it off after coming out of red zone, there's a virus on the surface of the gear. So you have to be very careful uh, uh, about the procedures. It's a two minute uh, video, so uh, please uh, take a look at it. Uh, please go to the video now, please. 固定したテープを外しますシューズカバーを消毒しますシューズカバーの紐を外しますアウター手袋を消毒します片方の手袋を裏側を表にしながら外していきます外した手袋の内側を持ちその手袋でもう一方の手袋をつかみながら手袋を外します前ファスナーを一番下まで下ろした後皮膚や髪の毛に触れないようにフードを外します肩から脱ぎます。腰の位置まで脱ぎます。シューズカバーも一緒に脱ぎます。ゴーグルの。後頭部ゴムバンドを引っ張り上げ、外します。マスクのゴム部分のみを触って、マスクを外します。インナー手袋を消毒して、裏返しながら手袋を外します。Thank you. So every time they cross the line uh, separating the red zone, the risk zone, and going into the green zone, uh, they had to do this every time. And uh, that's why they were OK and uh, came back home safely. Uh, next slide, please. So Self-Defense Force Central Hospital admitted 107 uh, PCR positive patients uh, with symptom. Uh, well, some people had a uh, no symptom at the beginning. I'll, I will show you later. Uh, there are quite a few uh, passengers crew from so many countries and uh, almost 40% of them are Japanese and uh, more than 60% of them are foreign passengers. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is the daily new uh, number of the patients uh, admitted to the Self-Defense Force uh, Central Hospital. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here I'm showing you some uh, CT image. Uh, the Central Hospital scanned every single patient who uh, they admitted. And uh, one third of them had a no symptom at the beginning. Uh, two thirds had a cough, fever, uh, but uh, they scan uh, every patient with CT and they found out uh, one third of asymptomatic patients already had a pneumonia and they call it silent pneumonia. Those patients who had a silent pneumonia had a no fever, no cough, no symptom at all but uh, eventually they knew that they're going to uh, develop a very severe symptom if they have silent pneumonia at the beginning. <coughs> so Central Hospital won all the other Japanese hospital to take CT scan of every patient. And if they had a silent pneumonia, they have to be ready for uh, further severe symptom later on. And I think that uh, helped uh, deal with uh, severe cases.
Uh, next slide, please. Oop, I'm running out of time. Um, this shows uh, number of uh, deaths uh, from flu and pneumonia. Um, the green line is the usual year, the average of uh, previous years. Uh, the red line include the margin of error of average. And this dotted uh, line is uh, this year. So you can tell actually Japan, well, uh, the last dot is probably at the beginning of April. Uh, so this is uh, actually uh, not, a, not a up to today, but you can tell the, there are not many uh, excess deaths in Japan, at least at the beginning of this coronavirus thing because we ask people to wash their hand. So there were less uh, number of uh, regular seasonal flu uh, this year and the death from flu and the pneumonia were actually less than average year. And then we had a death from coronavirus. So Japan has been able to manage without uh, many excess deaths uh, with coronavirus. Um, last slide, please. So what Self-Defense Force is doing is um, we are actually uh, training people now, training a uh, member of the local government and uh, training uh, private companies. Uh, right now, if you tested positive uh, and you have a symptom, we send them to the hospital. And if you tested positive by asymptomatic, uh, we'll send them to a hotel to uh, spend certain days. And in order to transport those people, um, well, Self-Defense Force uh, did transportation at the beginning, but now we are transferring uh, this transportation to bus and taxi companies because we, we have not many uh, tourists anymore. So the bus company or taxi company need the revenue. So instead of self-defense force driving those uh, patients to the hospital or hotel, we are asking bus company, taxi company to do that. And the hotel has uh, almost no tourists. So we are asking hotel to take care of those who are staying in hotel with asymptomatic coronavirus uh, so that they can actually generate the money. Um, self-defense force do uh, training and uh, we do the thing for the first week and we retreat. Um, right now we are beginning to see uh, heavy rains starting to fall in Japan and every year we get some flood, heavy rain, typhoon and the self-defense force need to go out for disaster relief. So we cannot really stretch our resource too thin and at the same time, when the global community is fighting against uh, this COVID-19, um, we are seeing Chinese increasing their military activities in East China Sea. Our fighter jet had to scramble more than 150 times in the first 90 days. And now Chinese ships are sitting on our territorial water or just a nearby almost every day. So self-defense force need to be prepared uh, to take on those issues in East China Sea. So we have to be uh, ready for those natural disasters and some aggression. So we cannot spend too much resource on the COVID-19. And that's why we need to uh, tackle uh, uh, those things. So we are providing uh, training and uh, to the uh, general public. Um, run, I'm running out of my time, so I will stop here. And uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening or this morning. Minister Kono, thanks so much. You'll never run out of time with us. We love to hear from you. Uh, and that was a very useful, uh, insightful uh, briefing. Um, there are a number of points I'd love to come back to. Uh, it, I'll start by saying how, the, how striking it has been that Japan has succeeded in, as we say, flattening the curve uh, on COVID-19 
with a minimum of you know, really tough national measures. But let me start by picking up the point uh, that you made that from uh, about the, the first week of February, nearly 5,000 self-defense force personnel were involved in helping the passengers on the Diamond Princess, collecting samples, distributing medicine, and so on. And yet not one of them was infected with COVID. That's, that's really very impressive. So you emphasized that the strict adherence to good health protocols was uh, the key to keeping your own service members safe and, and you're uh, spreading those teachings through uh, local government programs and private companies. But can I ask you, how is Japan helping uh, less developed countries, less developed neighbors? The Pacific Islands, for example, are incredibly vulnerable. They've got very weak public health systems and so on. So COVID-19, an outbreak on a Pacific Island would really be very destructive. Is that something that Japan and the Japan Self-Defense Force has focused on at all? Well, we are not actually going out of the country for COVID-19, I mean, the Self-Defense Force. The Japanese government has been assisting WHO tackling uh, this matter. Uh, we are doing a supplementary budget uh, and uh, we will probably uh, put some money in a supplementary budget to help the less developed country. Uh, we, post we had to postpone uh, 2020 Tokyo Olympic Paralympic Games to next year. So in order to have a successful Olympic Games, uh, we need to eradicate uh, COVID-19 from all over. You know, it, we, we just cannot say, yes, we're we, we done with it, but if other countries still have it, we cannot have a successful Olympic Games. So supporting Africa, Latin America, or Middle East country, or the Pacific Island country, I think luckily uh, we hear not many cases of COVID-19 from the Pacific Island, but uh, it's a, it's a quite a high priority for the Japanese government to assist the other country. Well, you're uh, unique in being both a uh, defense minister and a former uh, foreign minister, and, and you've brought your foreign minister's diplomatic skill set to the Ministry of Defense, I can see. You've been personally extraordinarily active. I saw that in the last week or two, you've spoken on the phone with your counterparts in the US, the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Indonesia, Singapore, New Zealand, Philippines, India, Australia, Canada, I probably missed a few there. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what the message is that you have tried to convey to your counterparts and what are some of the, the common concerns that crop up in these discussions? Well, uh, before COVID-19, the defense ministers were talking about how this climate change becoming our issue, I mean, the security issue. But now we are adding pandemic to the issue that our uh, security guys need to be watching. A lot of military uh, people are involved in countering the COVID-19 all over. I mean, US, UK, Italy, you know, a lot of people. Uh, so it's becoming one of the uh, major issue for the military as well. And then we also talked about what's going to happen post COVID-19 global order. Uh, we are a bit concerned after COVID-19, uh, maybe there's a, some threat coming to the international order, uh, like democracy against authoritarian regime, or freedom, free society against the uh, Orwellian society. So the like-minded country need to start uh, talking about what we need to be doing after coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Minister, you, you mentioned uh, at the end of your presentation the activism of China's uh, People's Liberation Army, uh, mm -hmm. in particular the, the East China Sea. So in the middle of the global pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, we saw the Chinese aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, along with mm -hmm. five other warships moving back and forth between Okinawa and Miyakojima, 
we saw a Chinese Coast Guard ship sinking a Vietnamese fishing mm -hmm. boat in the Paracels. Uh, the Chinese authorities set up uh, a, what they claim to be new administrative districts in the South China Sea to unilaterally uh, attempt to change the, the area's status quo. Um, how do you perceive the geostrategic risks from the pandemic? Well, um, we see their activities in East China Sea and South China Sea as well. And uh, as you said, uh, aircraft carriers moving around, moving through Okinawa Island to the Pacific. So, uh, you know, when the global community uh, facing a real threat uh, from coronavirus and we need to work together, uh, the currently we are not able to work together to fight against the coronavirus. Everyone's trying to scramble to buy masks or PPEs, or there's nobody really trying to take the leadership, how we can coordinate the fight against the coronavirus. I mean, China has been sending all their uh, medical equipment to African countries or some European countries and all those, but at the same time, they're trying to threat countries in uh, South China Sea or sending ships to Japan or sending fighter jet to Japan. So they are sending the uh, contradicting uh, message to the global right now. So I think we really need to sit down and, well, this pandemic will come back again. We have had a SARS, MERS, uh, COVID-19, and there'll be uh, definitely some other coming up. So we really need to sit down and uh, make WHO stronger. And then we need to talk what we should be doing. We failed quite a bit. We, we didn't have, uh, we, we were not prepared enough for this pandemic. So what need to be done uh, for the next round? I think this time, uh, the food industry or energy industry were doing uh, much better than the previously. So now there's a still free movement of uh, food stuff and uh, energy is coming out freely from the uh, Middle East and other places. We, we have learned some lessons, but uh, we need to do more. And uh, I think we need to sit down and start talking about what we, we have failed. So what we what need to be improved. Well, you're making a really profound set of points and I couldn't agree with you more, both on the importance of uh, learning from our experience and the importance of preparing for future uh, pandemics and crises, uh, but also the importance of uh, international uh, coordination and cooperation and leadership. But let me stay on the military uh, theme, given your current role, and ask, you know, we talked a little bit about an aircraft carrier uh, group, the Liaoning, but uh, the, the aircraft carrier group that has faced the most dramatic uh, challenge from COVID-19, of course, is the USS Ronald Reagan. Uh, excuse me, the USS Theodore Roosevelt. It's mm -hmm. the Reagan, of course, that's home ported in, uh, in Yokosuka. There was, a, I think, a, a, a modest outbreak there in Yokosuka, but the real challenge has been on uh, the uh, USS Theodore Roosevelt, where as many as a thousand sailors uh, tested positive. The entire carrier strike group, I think, has been held up for weeks in Guam. They just uh, perhaps put to port. The skipper was relieved of duty. Uh, so what kind of a challenge does the pandemic pose to military readiness? And particularly, are you concerned that the disease could be compromising the alliance's uh, deterrence capability at a moment when, as you've pointed out, uh, there's an increase in uh, troubling military activities by the People's Liberation Army? Well, U.S. Forces Japan uh, took care of uh, very well, I think. Uh, Ronald Reagan is now getting ready to move out of uh, Yokosuka. Uh, they don't have many uh, people infected on board. So 
I don't think the readiness of U.S. forces Japan compromised at all this time. And uh, self-defense force, uh, we are okay now. Uh, uh, I mean, as of today, there's nobody infected. Uh, so we, we were not, our posture was not uh, compromised. But this could happen to any ships of any Navy. Uh, I think we were lucky. Uh, Self-Defense Force has now two ships out to the Middle East. And uh, there are some outbreaks in the Middle East. So when they are refueling, they, I mean, none of them are going off the ship. They have to stay on for six months on the ship while they were in uh, Arabian Sea. So it's kind of hard for them, but uh, we cannot help it. And uh, our self-defense force, you know, if you go to the bases, uh, we have so many uh, self-defense force member living in one base and it's more like a dormitory. So if somebody get the virus, it will spread in the base quite fast. So we have to be uh, very careful. So, so far, uh, against coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, we are okay, but uh, this, this could happen again. And uh, every, every military is vulnerable for the spread of pandemic. So we really never really thought about how to protect our members from uh, pandemic, but uh, this is going to be a serious issue now. So we, we need to be, and thank God we have a good hospital system in self-defense force and they are very capable and they are very well trained against those uh, disease. So I think we need to invest more so we can develop uh, testing method as soon as possible so we can detect who, who are actually infected and quarantine them. Well, Minister, speaking of hospitals, speaking of investments and speaking of ships, uh, do you give any thought to the idea of Japan acquiring a dedicated hospital ship? Uh, I know that's been suggested by some diet members. I ride my bike around Manhattan and used to uh, ride past the U.S. Navy hospital ship, the Comfort, that was sent to New York at the peak of the COVID outbreak here in April. Is that something that uh, Japan might consider? Uh, yes, we are actually considering, uh, not just a self-defense force, but uh, uh, those government agency uh, in charge of the disaster management and uh, you know, the health and welfare ministry. Uh, that hospital ship could be used for, you know, these cases or some disaster relief or at the peacetime we can send them to the Pacific Island country to treat uh, some severe uh, disease among them. So we are now thinking about it and well, it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna be ready for COVID-19, but uh, it could be uh, something we have for the next round. Okay. Well, Minister, I, we've got a lot of fantastic uh, questions from uh, Columbia University uh, folks and from others, but I can't let you go without asking you one more thing, which is this. Um, I recently, just the other day, saw a great video of you inaugurating Japan's Space Operations Squadron. So mm -hmm. Congratulations. That's really, okay. really cool. But uh, on the same day, um, I saw a report that Japan's defense ministry is going to be drawing up protocols for potential encounters with UFOs. <laughs> so come on, Minister, this is your chance to really make some news. Is Japan, is the self-defense force gearing up to protect Earth against space aliens? I'm thinking of the movie Independence Day. Uh, or does the uh, space operations squadron have a, have a less exciting mission? Well, unfortunately, our space operations squadron uh, is not going to deal with UFO. That's not uh, one of their mission. But actually, I told our air self-defense force to think about the protocol, uh, what we need to do when they actually encounter UFO. Um, I, don't, I don't really believe in there's somebody coming from the space 
but uh, I mean, US forces put out some video of UFO. So as an alliance partner, I thought it would be necessary for us to think about, start thinking about it. Okay, well, I'm glad you're thinking about it. So let me uh, turn uh, back to uh, my partner and colleague, Professor Kokani, and let's hear some of the questions from our, from our viewers and from her students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me first uh, mention that there has been questions asked about how you can get the Hiroshige mask. <laughs> so um, that um, if we, there could be an answer provided by the end of the program, that would be great. But um, on a little more um, serious note, um, as you know, at, thank you, <laughs> um, at Columbia, um, all the students had to um, vacate the campus, or most students had to vacate the campus in March. So there's one student who is asking a question from Singapore, where she is right now. And I'd like to pick that up. Rianne Tan asked, um, first, what contingency plan does Japan have in order to avoid a second wave of COVID-19, as we've seen in Singapore and South Korea? Um, and what best practices can Japan share with other countries in the region, Southeast Asia, specifically looking at the role of the self-defense forces? Well, we are just getting over with our first wave and uh, probably by the end of May, uh, sort of uh, we are reopening our society, our economy. But I, I think everyone is worried about the second wave. So we need to reopen slowly, I guess. Uh, we don't have any law to force people to lock down in this situation. The government simply asking people to stay home and that uh, we manage to uh, keep the uh, number of fatality very low. And we would like to continue uh, this way. Um, we are not quite sure what, what need to be done to avoid the second wave. I, I, I think uh, some kind of second wave, uh, I don't think we can avoid, but uh, we need to manage. And uh, if we see the sign of it, I think we need to ask people to stay home again. So we have to take it slowly. What, what was the additional question? <laughs> Sorry. I can't hear you. You're on mute, you're on mute. Uh, what well, practice, I'm sorry, uh, uh, practices that Japan can share with other countries in the region, um, meaning Southeast Asia, actually Mohammed El Beltaji asked via YouTube the same question. What countries in Southeast Asia do you see as most vulnerable? And is there any specific um, country they have in mind that you might think that Japan can help out with? Thank you. Well, um, when I was a foreign minister, I was quite involved in those uh, Muslim refugees uh, coming from Myanmar to Bangladesh, and they are still staying in the camp. And with this cyclone, uh, super cyclone actually coming to Bangladesh, they must be suffering. But uh, uh, as I saw their living condition in the camp, if coronavirus came in, I think it would spread uh, so rapidly. So those refugees in this region, I think we need to pay extra attention and uh, I think we need to help each other uh, and uh, those refugees uh, on my mind. Thank you. Um, um, another question, this is, I'm gonna be combining a couple of questions on US-Japan Alliance. Uh, one question is from Nina Harano, who is a Japanese student studying at Columbia College. She's here in New York City right now. Um, she went to high school in Okinawa. So she's asking if there was some, um, if you can elaborate on the cooperation that has taken place so far at the ground level in Japan uh, over COVID between the U.S. and Japan. Well, um, the U.S. Marines in Okinawa uh, uh, helping the uh, medical people in Okinawa. I think they made a face shield among the Marines and uh, uh, they donated to the uh, medical workers in Okinawa uh, to protect themselves. So there are a lot of cooperation going on on the ground and we are very grateful for their action there. Thank you. Um, and Stephen asked via email, 
um, aside from U.S. forces, how much coordination collaboration is happening between Japan and South Korea? Uh, with both countries in such close proximity to China and their travelers from and from China, uh, but both countries have handled it pretty well, all things considered. So is there any collaboration, cooperation you see? Um, I know that you have a very close relationship with South Korea going forward. Is there something that we should be expecting? Well, right now, because of this COVID-19, all the joint exercise with other country and uh, self-defense force are postponed or canceled. Uh, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, there were uh, talk among uh, my uh, director general level that are uh, at the minister level. Myself, uh, Secretary Esper and the uh, Korean defense minister will have a, a conference call uh, sometime soon, because we usually meet in Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, but that has been canceled this year. So instead of going there meeting in person, uh, we are trying to uh, talk about the regional issue soon. And uh, hopefully, uh, once this COVID-19 is over, uh, Japan, Korea, US, and other country could participate uh, in uh, joint exercise. I think the RIMPAC in Hawaii is still on and uh, we are sending our Maritime Self-Defense Force ships to Hawaii to participate in RIMPAC. And uh, if uh, ROK could send a uh, Navy, uh, we're gonna be doing the joint exercise with US Navy as well. Thank you. Um, you just answered another question that was asked by Derek Smith who just is a U.S. Army um, officer who just received his MA from Columbia about the security cooperation in near and long term. So uh, I guess we can be hopeful that things will come back in order after things settle down a bit. Um, turning to a, a little bit more long term academic question, this is from Professor Philip Lipsy at Tor University of Toronto. He asked, um, although COVID-19 likely emerged from a natural source, the pandemic appears to re reveal serious vulnerabilities in all major countries to biological warfare or bioterrorism. From the perspective of national defense, what type of reforms need to be implemented based on lessons learned from the pandemic? So how, what are the lessons learned from the pandemic on biological warfare or bioterrorism? Um, yes, uh, Self-Defense Force actually had a uh, chemical uh, terrorism uh, with sarin in uh, subway in Tokyo some years ago. And uh, we have been sort of uh, training uh, self-defense force against the nuclear biochemical warfare. And those who went in uh, on board Diamond Princess uh, came from those uh, medical team of uh, uh, biochemical uh, group. And because nobody get infected uh, on board, we sort of increased our trust and the confidence in them. And uh, now they are going around those uh, local government and the private company uh, educating how to protect themselves. And uh, I think uh, in, in the future, uh, when we have some kind of, uh, we, we usually have national natural disaster drill. We may have to uh, consider uh, some kind of uh, anti-virus uh, protection drill uh, of some kind. I, I don't think we're gonna be uh, doing that against the bio warfare, but uh, for the protecting people from a general pandemic, uh, we may need to do some kind of exercise in a bigger scale. Uh, that's something uh, we may have to think about it. Right now, there's no uh, plan yet. I think uh, we are still focusing on the COVID-19. But once this COVID-19 thing is over, I think there are a lot of review we have to do. Uh, do we have enough stock in uh, PPE, masks, gloves, and all those things? Uh, what is the uh, manufacturing capability of PPE in Japan? Or what about the manufacturing capability of basic medication in Japan? Uh, do we have strong supply chain uh, for those medication and all those 
you know, vaccination and all those stuff. So there's a lot of review need to be done. But uh, before that, I think we need to uh, eradicate this uh, coronavirus first. Thank you. Um, switching to a more broader question, um, from, this is from Susan Halper from um, YouTube. Um, she asked, you said there has been discussion about world order after COVID-19 and concern about authoritarian behavior. Has the U.S. been participating in this in a meaningful way? And if so, if not, what can Japan do about this? Well, when I spoke with the Defense Secretary, uh, we talked about uh, some challenges that we may have to face. And there's, I mean, it's almost bilateral telephone conversation. So it's not like defense ministers sitting down uh, doing the Zoom conference. Not, it's not like that. But uh, I think the post coronavirus, uh, I think it'll be a, a little bit new society, a little bit different society uh, domestically and the international order could be uh, different. So we need to start thinking what need to be improved, like WHO certainly need to be improved and the global supply chain need to be strengthened and how to deal with uh, pandemic. Uh, should, should we give government very strong power so they can order people what to do for a long time or like what we did we didn't even give the government uh, enough law to tell people what to do. We simply had to ask people, but uh, we coped with it. So there's a lot of things we need to talk about. And uh, I think either way, we need to keep democracy. We need to keep uh, free society. We need to keep the market economy. Uh, you know, compared to the previous time, the energy price, food price is more stable. And it's probably because we still keeping free trade even in this uh, time. So the free trade, free society, democracy, uh, market economy can cope with pandemic. And I believe we can do it better than authoritarian Orwellian society. Thank you. Um, so one related question, Kana Koichi asked via YouTube, um, uh, Kevin Rudd and Gordon Brown contributed an opinion piece in Nikkei Asian Review on April 8, 2020, that Japan should lead G20 in devising global COVID-19 rescue package. Do you agree? What, what, what do you mean by rescue package? I don't know, <laughs> but do you think you, the Japan should take the lead in G20? Um, actually, Philip Lipsy once again asked a similar question. Do you see the, uh, how um, the US and Japan have both been critical of WHO's handling of COVID-19? Do you see the need for other institutions or frameworks to strengthen international cooperation in response to the pandemic? Well, uh, we, we believe in WHO. Uh, we may have to review some of uh, activities, but uh, I don't think we need a different framework. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, Abe and Deputy Prime Minister Aso have been proposing to create a fund to buy a patent for new vaccination or new drug for the COVID-19. Uh, for those pharmaceutical company, it'll be probably very difficult to uh, provide those uh, drug or vaccination free, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their stakeholders. So we are proposing G7 will chip in and we purchase their patent for the vaccination or drug. So we can, the G7 can provide those drugs uh, free or cheaper to the developing economy uh, to help people there. So that's, uh, that's the Japanese leadership, I think. Right. Thank you. So this will be the last question to you. Um, this is from Joshua Walker, president of Japan Society in New York. Um, he asked, based on what you have laid out, what should US-Japan priorities be moving forward post COVID? What is in our control? How do we move beyond while recognizing there are a lot of unknowns? So what's the future ahead for US-Japan priorities? 
Well, I think the future uh, need to be trying to maintain the current international order. Uh, in order, in order to do that, I think we need to take up the trade issues. Uh, we need to talk about the international organization like the WHO. And uh, we also need to be talking about the security issues. Uh, so there are a lot of things, but uh, I think it's not just the US and Japan, but uh, those like-minded countries who share the common value need to sit down and work together to uh, you know, protect our values that we believe in. Thank you. Um, at that note, um, can I go over to you, um, Danny or Mr. Russell, for your thoughts about this exchange and um, what you might want to add? Yes, thank you so much, Tagaku. Uh, that, it was a lot of fun to hear great questions uh, from the viewers and from your students. Mr. Kono, um, you know, my own experience working in the White House, uh, working in the State Department, uh, supporting America's rebalance to the Asia Pacific. That taught me just how valuable uh, the US Japan alliance really is. Mm -hmm. And in the wake of the uh, 311 tsunami and the Fukushima disaster in 2011, I was very proud to have played a supporting role uh, in Operation Tomodachi and so on. So I know how important it is that in the midst of a new global disaster that Japan and the Japan Self-Defense Force is stepping up, not, you know, not only to protect uh, Japan citizens, but also to assist and to share best practices with other countries in the way that you described. I have to say that um, I know I'm not alone in really admiring uh, your candor and your honesty, frankly, your humility in recognizing that our governments all could have done much more, uh, could have done it much better, much more quickly, uh, and uh, could have done it with better international coordination uh, in order to deal with the current pandemic. And uh, I take your very important point that we need to learn from our mistakes, uh, that we need to think through questions about funding vaccine patents, about maintaining supply chains, about protecting free trade and democratic freedoms, uh, finding ways to work together through the WHO and other international cooperative mechanisms in order to protect ourselves and the world from the next uh, pandemic, the next crisis. So uh, we learned a lot from you and I just will close by saying thank you. Thanks to you and to uh, all of your colleagues for what you're doing and thank you in particular for uh, joining Tagaku and myself today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Minister Kono for your final thoughts. Well, um, you know, if you look at the Asia and compare Asia to Europe, Europe has EU, although EU missed the UK now, but, and uh, NATO. Uh, we don't have EU nor NATO in Asia. Uh, every Asian country a bit different. And uh, so we need to work harder to uh, talk to the Asian country and trying to have all the Asian country looking uh, same goal. And uh, that's something we really need to be doing. And Japan alone cannot do that. We need to work with ASEAN. We need to work with Australia, United States, and India, and other countries. And uh, this COVID-19 is showing us how vulnerable or, uh, Asia is or Asian people are. And uh, that's why we need to work together and uh, we have to work together to get rid of COVID-19 now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister Kono, for um, sharing your busy schedule with us. I think we all learned so much and came out with many important issues to think about. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time, so I need to conclude um, um, at the end. I'd like to thank all the staff that Thank you for the mask once again. That's a wonderful mask. Um, thanks for the staff who helped us put together at Asia Society in New York and the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia. And special thanks to my friend, Chairman James Kondo 
at the International House of Japan for hosting a Jiu Society's Sawako Hidaka and the Ministry of Defense press office. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us early Thursday morning or, or Thursday night in Japan and around the world. Uh, for those who joined us late, um, I would like to note that the video will be later posted on Weatherhead East Asian Institute website or at the at weaicolumbia.edu or at the Asia Society website. And for those interested in Columbia and Asia Society's global coverage of COVID-19 and other upcoming programs, more information is available on weai.columbia.edu and asiasociety.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister Kono. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Uh, for thank you. And thank you to everyone for um, joining us and have a nice day and have a nice evening. And please take care. Bye.